Pastor Mike Parker come to you from Watchman Studios with another Watchman video broadcast. We're talking about the Betty Andreessen affair. If you uh, take a look on the screen, uh, at least three books um, is what I have in my library, The Andreessen Affair, written by Ray Fowler, introduced by J. Allen Hynek, The Andreessen Affair, Phase Two, The Continuing Investigation of a Woman's Abduction by Alien Beings. That also written by Ray Fowler. Uh, I'm aware of at least two to three others that I do not have, I've not read. But what I have from the three that I do have, including this last one, A Lifting of the Veil, which was written by Betty Andreessen herself and her second husband, her first husband, left her. I don't know if the aliens had anything to do with that or not. But she ended up marrying, get this, she ended up marrying a guy who also has claimed that he's been abducted by aliens. Now, um, just the three books that I have on her and her subject are enough for me to link every square inch of this entire alien and UFO matter right right in the scriptures, because clearly she is dealing with devils. She's dealing with principalities. And a little bit later on in this whole alien series, I'm going to show you the connection that's made among, uh, I'll, I'll say it this way, when Paul warned us about another gospel, when he warned us about we're not as they who corrupt the word of God, I think Paul was aware of some books that were being written during his lifetime. They're called the Gnostic Gospels. A large collection of this was found in Nag Hammadi, Egypt, back in the 40s. And they are clearly the total opposite of everything that we have in the Gospels, the New Testament, including the Old Testament of our King James Bible. But there, those books, one in particular, I believe directly connects the aliens that we've looked at. We looked at the reptilians so far. We're going to end up dealing with the greys. What I was going to start out this next series on was dealing with the Nordics. But once I really found out what I found out about Betty Andreessen and her life and what's been happening with her and who she met, what she won't say, and just the way that she's carried herself in all this, claiming now that she is a born-again, Bible-believing, Bible-believing, fundamentalist Christian, claiming that, and yet these aliens come through their, her door and she welcomes them as angels sent from God, clearly. This woman, if she's still alive, I'm not her judge. So I can't say, yeah, this woman's been turned over to a reprobate mind. Maybe it's not too late for her. Maybe she'll watch this. I don't know. But clearly, the things that she has seen, the things that she has claimed, the things she has been told by the aliens, absolutely merit the reading of these verses. When you, when you connect the dots here the way I'm trying to do for you, and I appreciate it. A guy, a guy made a comment on what he has seen so far of, of my alien series, and he said, you know what? He said, I didn't think any of this alien stuff was even worth the time of day as a Christian, but he said, I can see, Pastor Hoggard, where you're starting to connect the dots here with what's in the scriptures, and I appreciate that. I really do, because that's it's exactly what I'm trying to show you, okay? Let me read the two scriptures that I have in mind. And clearly, that's what not only the Andreessen affair is all about, and everything that she has seen, reported, been told by these aliens, absolutely, to me, makes perfect sense with what we read in the scriptures. First place, we're going to go 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And I want you to pay attention to the very words, because the words mean something, right? 
I mean, these words are not men's words. Men didn't write them. Well, okay, let me back up. Men wrote them. Men did not author them. They were authored by Jesus himself, who was given those words by his Father, who sent those words through the Holy Spirit for the apostles and the prophets to write them down. Okay, so these words mean something. Let me show you what I mean. Starting out, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, we won't get past like the first, well, we'll get past the first verse here. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly and indeed bear with me, for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband. Stop right here. This, as far as we're going to get, right here. I've espoused you to one husband. I've been sort of letting you in on this. We're going to see today that Betty Andreessen claims to have met the one, the one. And here Paul says, I've espoused my church. And she claims to be part of the church. Paul says, I've espoused you as the bride to one husband. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are, uh, I and the Father are, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Okay? So anyway, I've espoused you to one husband. We're going to focus on the one today. That I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear. Paul's fears were warranted. Lest by any means. Lest by alien means. I'm just... He says any, so alien would be part of any. Lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. For if he that cometh preacheth, number one, another Jesus, not the same Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. He starts out by saying another Jesus. And I've made this connection before. In 1 Samuel 28, we have a picture of every doctrine in the Bible so that you can see, you can see into the future what it's going to look like because we can use the Bible to see into the past. We don't need some, you know, these aliens, some of the stories that I've heard, I'm not sure that I believe it. But one story says that the aliens gave this cube to some guys in the military, gave it to Eisenhower, actually. And it was a way to look at things that are going to happen in the future. It's a divination box is what it is. Okay, and I don't know that I believe that, but even if it's true, we have a more sure word of prophecy. All we have to do to look ahead is to look back and see what's happened. And there is a perfect picture of every prophecy in the Bible. And we have one of the pictures of another Jesus is in 1 Samuel 28. We know, and I keep laying this case out, this was where Saul goes to the witch, the woman who had a familiar spirit at Endor. He goes to Endora off of Bewitched, right? So he goes to her and he says, I want you to bring up somebody by the familiar spirit. By the familiar spirit. Okay, and a familiar spirit is not the spirit of some dead person that gets to come out of wherever they are and make an appearance. It's a diff it's an unclean devil spirit that's used for divination that is familiar with the person that they are pretending to be. Very important to keep this in mind because God has said, um, God has told Saul earlier in this chapter, I will not speak to you by prophet or by Urim, or by vision. So clearly, it can't be Samuel. God, if Samuel was still alive standing there, God would say, Samuel, don't say a word to him. So there's no way in the world God's going to let Samuel come back from the dead to speak to Saul when God has prohibited prophets from speaking to Saul. Clearly, that's how it is. All right? 
And then we have the other verse where it says, so Saul died for, uh, I can't remember, for rejecting the word of the Lord and for consulting with a, for consulting with a familiar spirit. And it says right in that verse that he consulted with the familiar spirit. So it wasn't Samuel. So anyway, so when, when she conjures, she says in verse 11, whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, bring me up Samuel. Verse 11, it's interesting because this month in Pastor Mark Online, I've been talking about the number 11, being the 11th month, November. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. And, um, and so that's why some people say it really was Samuel. But, um, and Saul was saying, why hast thou deceived? For thou art Saul, or she asked that. And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. Gods ascending out of the earth. And one of them was pretending to be Samuel. And I want you to get this in your mind. Here, Samuel is dead. So here is, Samuel is a prophetic type of Jesus. And in this case, you know, we believe Jesus is coming back in the clouds, down from heaven. Where's the Antichrist? He's down there, down in hell, in the pit. She saw gods ascending out of the earth. And so one of these gods pretends to be the resurrected Samuel. Bum, bum, bum. Right? Okay? So anybody pretending to be Jesus Christ, and it's not Jesus Christ, it is going to be the ultimate of all familiar spirits. It's going to be another Jesus, not the one that you and I know, the one that we pray to and through, not the one who inspired every word of this book, not the one who said, in the volume of the book, it is written to me to do thy will, O God. Jesus swore to his Father that he would do all things according to what was written. Okay? And that's exactly what I believe. Uh, and Betty Andreessen pretends to believe that, but she doesn't. So here we have, and, and I've said this before, with the other Jesus comes the other spirit, and, and with those come another spirit gospel. That's the first time Paul used that phrase, another gospel. He uses that and another related phrase again. So it's going to give us a total of four times the Bible is going to warn us about any other gospel, any other gospel, another gospel, another gospel. Galatians chapter 1. Pay attention to the language. I'm, verse 6, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. That is Betty Andreessen and her husband and all of the people who would believe her story and believe that she's a born-again fundamentalist Christian. Because clearly she's not. I'll show you the proof. You say, I'm not her judge. You're exactly right. I'm a fruit inspector. And if the fruit don't match up, I will let God judge her. Okay? Um, just like he's going to judge me, which is not another. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ that though we or an angel from heaven, pay attention to that, preach, Paul's telling you how it's going to happen, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, then let him be accursed. Let him be accursed. So it's very plain. The gospel is laid out very clearly in this book. The gospel is this book. This is the good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. 
and it's Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords, the Son of God, the Word made flesh and dwelt among us. He is the everlasting Father. He is the Prince of Peace. He is God's Son, and He is the mighty God. Absolutely no doubt in my mind. He is not, He does not contain God. He is not a container for God, or is not contained by God. I'm saying all these things for a reason, because we're going to get into Andreessen's testimony again. We're going to see from her own words. Now remember, Ray Fowler has, has hired a hypnotist, and she is doing what's called regression. A lot of people who, they start, these are lost people, they are very troubled people, and I feel bad for them, but it's like Satan picks them out and it's usually family clusters. Usually when someone finally goes and gets regressed and finds out that they've been on alien ships, that's when they start finding out that this has been going on since childhood and more than likely their parents and their grandparents were involved in it as well. Then they find out that their children are being taken in ships and they can do nothing about it. They can do absolutely nothing to stop them. No one that, well, I, I won't say it that way. I've got testimonies from people that have told me they've seen these little grays coming to them. When the name Jesus came out of their mouth, gone. Okay? So we're going we're gonna to hear it from Betty's own words about her meeting the one. If you remember last week, she went to the door. And no matter how hard the regressionists tried to get her to tell them what was behind the door, she repeatedly said, I can't, I can't tell you. I can't tell you. Will, will, they, will the aliens not let you? I can't tell you that. There was just, they, no matter what they tried, there was no way they could get it out of her. But since that time, and I don't know what all's changed. I don't know what's all in the other books. But in the latest book that she wrote called Lifting the Veil, then she starts really giving out a lot more information about the one that she sees behind that door than she ever has before. So let's pick it up. This is from the Andreessen Affair. I think this is phase two. Fred Mack says, what's happening now? And she says, I'm coming out of that door, and it was wonderful. Did the one say something exciting? I can't tell you. I'm sorry. Would would you say that the one was God? Betty says, do you really know what God is? Fred Mack says, I don't know. I was hoping you had seen him and could therefore tell me. Now, keep this in mind. Because our Savior said, no man hath seen God at any time. No man has. What we have seen, what everybody has seen in the Old Testament and New Testament was Jesus Christ. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. But no man has seen God at any time. And that man would include Betty and Dreesen. Okay? But what we're going to find out is she's going to weave these ideas together about who the one is and who God is. So let's continue. Fred Max says, go on. Betty says, and we're floating along. Fred says, you're not walking, you're floating, go on. We're coming up to this big wall of glass and a big, 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 big door. It's made out of glass. Fred says, does it have hinges? She says, no, it is so big and there is, I can't explain it. It's a door after a door after a door after a door. He is stopping there and telling me to stop. I'm just stopping here. And he says, now you shall enter the door to see the one. Notice that's capital O. And he says, fear not. Stop right here. That sounds like what our Savior says to us. You see, all this is just, it's detestable to me. Because I know who these aliens are. I know what they are. They're devils. They're familiar spirits, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. No doubt in my mind whatsoever. They are part of the evil angels. They are, they are in league with Satan. They're going to get kicked out of heaven thrust completely out. They're all going to fall to the earth one of these days and rise up out of the pit. I have absolutely no doubt about that. 
and for them to use this idea like being Christ is detestable to me, all right? I am offended. I am deeply offended because I know my Savior. He's not hiding behind some door. He is the door. Anyway, then Betty appeared to undergo an out-of-body experience. Betty, and I'm standing there, and I'm coming out of myself. There's two of me. There's two of me there. Fred says, are you looking at yourself? She says, "Uh uh-huh. Do you feel as if you're in both bodies? No, that one over there is like, um, like what? Well, that one over there, it's like a twin, but it's still like those people I saw in those, those ice cubes. He says, in other words, a motionless copy of you. She says, yeah. Okay, do you see the one yet? The one? No. Okay, go on. I'm coming up to the door, and the little person is saying, now you shall enter the great door and see the glory of the one. And I'm standing face to face with that door. Then Betty became very puzzled. Fred says, where are you? I'm before this huge, great big door. It's glass, layers and layers of glass. What are you standing on? She says, glass. So let me ask you now. You're going to see the one now, right? Yeah. Why are you going to see the one? Betty says, because it's time for me. They said, for me to go home to see the one. Fred says, all right. In other words, does this imply that the one is someone that you've seen before? Betty says, I don't remember. Okay, do you know why it's time to see the one? No. Why haven't you asked questions? Betty says, they haven't been there very often. Those little people haven't been there very much for me to ask. Fred says, yeah, but they're asking you to do a lot of things, shall we say. She says, I know, but I'm in their place. I can't do anything. Fred, okay, in a moment, you're going to see the one. Then there was a smile on Betty's face. Fred says, you seem happy. Why are you so happy? It's just, uh, I can't tell you about it. Fred says, all right, I know you can't tell me, but I want you to do a few things. I want you to ask yourself why you're being shown that which you're being shown. In other words, you weren't given this trip just for a free ride, so to speak. They want you to see what you're seeing. Does that make sense? Betty says, yes. Fred, Fred Max says, all right, now that you're there, ask yourself, what am I going to get out of this? Or what am I getting out of this? Why am I here? What am I supposed to think about after I've after I leave here. Betty says, oh, it matters not what I get from it. What do you mean? It's, words cannot explain it. It's wonderful. It's for everybody. I just can't tell you this. You can't? Okay, why can't you? For one thing, it's too overwhelming, and it is, it is undescribable. I just can't tell you. Besides, it's just impossible for me to tell you. All right. Are you capable, when looking around you, to tell yourself? Betty says, I see it. Fred says, right. That which you can see, you have a grasp of, even if you don't understand it. Betty says, I understand it. I'm sorry. I'm just sorry. I wish I could share it with you. Now, I'm here to tell you, that is, if she's home, heaven is home. It's the promised land. It's our inheritance. We're not of this world. We belong up there, right? So if she's home in heaven, and that's God, Jesus, God took John, the Apostle John, in the Spirit. John got to see everything up there. He got to see God on the throne, which, I mean, you understand, the reason for the veils in the tabernacle was so that nobody could see behind that last veil to see God's glory there on the Ark of the Covenant, except for the high priest. But now that Jesus, the high priest, has come, and he's lifted the veil... Get, you get what I'm saying here? Okay, the veil has been rent, and now there is no partition between us and the mercy seat of God. We can go directly to God. We can see the throne in heaven. We can see the seven spirits of God. We can see, she's standing on a sea of glass. We can see that through the pages of the scriptures, and it's plainly written to us. But this place, no, we have to keep that a secret. My friends, that is mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. That's exactly where that's from. Now we're going to switch over to the book that she wrote, A Lifting of the Veil. The true life story of a couple that had to cope not only with the reality of the UFO alien experience, but harassment by U.S. government agencies as well. And her husband, Bob, is 
making this claim that the government hacked into his computer, stole all his information out of it, and that black helicopters flying around. You know, maybe they are, okay? That's not as big a deal to me as what she is saying. So in this book, which, I, I, again, I say it's written somewhere 2014, 2015, it's written of late, okay? She's, uh, I think she's probably got to be in her 70s, maybe a little bit older than that, okay? And her and her husband are writing now, and she's going to sh she's gonna give you a lot more detail about who the one is. Again, this is from the book Lifting the Veil. So far, during my encounters, I've been physically taken to see the one four different times. The first time was in 1915 when I was 13 years old. As I stood before the beautiful doorway, I was lifted up and placed in the world of light. I stood bathed within the light of his awesome realm of wholeness. It seemed alive with hidden energy of unseen wonder, power, and mystery. See it? It's exactly what I'm telling you. The spirit, when Paul talked about that other spirit, that other spirit was Revelation 17, written all in capital letters for you so you don't miss it. 13 words, mystery, Babylon the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And that number 13 fits perfectly in with the beast, the false prophet, both in Revelation 13, the false prophet is, is foreseen in typology in Acts chapter 13. He's foreseen in the law in Deuteronomy 13. Uh, the corruption of God's word in Matthew 13. Ezekiel 13 talks about false prophets. I mean, come on, how many places? I mean, there's a ton of them in the Bible where this number 13 is linked with the false prophet, the false spirit, the false gospel, the false Jesus. Okay, this is a place of mystery to her. Uh, bright light everywhere with the sudden appearance of a much brighter form of overwhelming light, which was the one. 17 years later, I was taken to places I had never seen before. As I stood before the glowing light, I heard the one say, Betty, you have seen and you have heard. Do you understand? I have chosen you to show the world. Stop right here. Now, if this one really is Jesus, then he's violated his own contract. The new covenant by which we're saved is a contract. I'm not under two contracts. I'm not under the old covenant and simultaneously the new covenant. You can't be under two competing different covenants. The Bible makes that very clear. Jeremiah 31 prophesied that there was coming a new covenant, not like the covenant he made at Sinai. Paul says, which that covenant was to be done away, and it was done away in Christ. So now we're under a new contract. And the just like in any contract you sign, any legitimate contract you sign was, corpus, you know, legally written up, written up right, not like on a piece of paper writing it out between two guys. There's always language in that contract that says this contract and the words that are in this contract comprise the whole of the agreement between whatever parties are part of that contract. In other words, once it's signed, sealed, it's done. There are not other terms and conditions sitting out somewhere else to be handed in later that can be imposed upon that contract. That's illegal. And it's same thing here. Revelation 22, Jesus, Jesus himself said, For I testify to every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of this book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city, which is not this place, and from the things which are written in this book, and he which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly, even so come quickly, come, Lord Jesus. 
That was Jesus' own words. He testified to these, and he said, surely I come quickly. So we have here an addition to God's word, and Jesus would never do that. Never. Um, but anyway, the one says, I've chosen you to show the world. Isn't that special? I, and I don't like being mean like this. But this woman is playing ball for Mystery Babylon the Great. And I'm, I'm like David. I hate every false way. I don't like it when somebody messes with this book and what's in this book. She says, the third time the beings brought me before the one was in 1989. Betty describes being taken in a ship to an unknown location in space where she says, quote, I became a glowing form of yellow light. Stop right here. Oh, 2 Corinthians 11, again, in the same chapter where he says, For he that cometh preacheth another Jesus. And I, I'm getting ahead of myself here because I've got this in my notes. 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, 14, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. See, she says, I became a glowing form of yellow light. She was transformed into a being of light as one of the one's ministers. It just matches Scripture. Um, I became a glowing form of yellow light. The precious oneness, unity, and feelings of peace and love rippled through my body. I wanted to stay, but I knew I had to go back for others so they would see and understand the oneness of our Creator. Did she just call the One the Creator? That's an abomination. See, again, I'm not judging her. I'm inspecting the fruit. And the fruit that she bears is corrupt. Therefore, the seed of that fruit is corrupt, and therefore what the seed of that fruit produces is corruption. Okay? And it's all part of that new gospel that's coming. The fourth and last time I remember being brought to see the one was on July 21st, 1994. During this new encounter, the one delivered something personal and imprinted it on my mind. Once again, our meeting prove to me that in the future I will definitely have something I must do for the one and the world. You know, she's not the only one that has made a claim that God or Jesus or angels or aliens downloaded something into somebody's mind. It's not the first one. Jim Staley. Remember him? He was one of these Hebrew Roots guys before he got locked up in prison for a ton of years for scamming old people out of money. That guy. He says he was he was an associate pastor in you know some you know new church or whatever. And he realized one day that his entire understanding of the gospel was all wrong, and God downloaded to him the entire meaning of the book of Romans. Just like down, and he literally said, God downloaded it into my mind. So now he has this new revelation that the book of Romans doesn't really say we're saved by grace through faith. we got to go back and keep the law. That's what he said. Okay? And there are a ton of others. She's not the only one in the whole alien movement who's claimed that the aliens downloaded something into their brains. The children at the aerial school in Zimbabwe, Africa, said that when they locked eyes with those gray aliens, 62 children interviewed all said the exact same thing. 
Not all of them locked eyes with the aliens, but the ones who did said when they saw their eyes and locked eyes with them, the aliens immediately started downloading images and ideas and things into their mind about things that are going to happen in the future. This is no different than any other alien scam that I've seen before. And I guarantee you it's a replacement for this book or being sold as some addition to this book. But she still claims that, you know, she's getting on up there in age, right? She still claims that the one has something that he wants her to do for him and the rest of the world. Well, what if she dies before that ever happens? Will that mean that she was wrong? No, it just means that the angels lied to her like they do a lot of other people. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he is God. He as God. Now I'm going to show you Betty Andreessen explaining the one. And I, and I guarantee you it matches perfectly with he as God. Sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was with, yet with you, I told you these things? And now you know what withhold it that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity. See, she said it's a place of mystery. And it's the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Paul was right. It was working in his day and it's working in our day. It's not, they're not waiting for the Antichrist to show up to do everything. They're doing everything in advance so that he can show up. For the mystery of it, iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. That's the Bible. And shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. See, Andreessen claims that this one is so great and bright. I guarantee you, when Jesus shows up, shoot, we'll be able to tell. Even him who's coming after is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, which this falls in the category of. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Now, again, I can't judge Betty Andreessen, so I don't know why God has allowed her to believe what totally amounts to a strong delusion. But apparently God has. God has allowed this woman for whatever reason. It, he's God. He knows her better than anybody. He's allowed her to be deceived by strong delusion. And she's out spreading that same delusion with her testimony and her books. Revelation 13, 1, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, his feet were as the feet of a bear, his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And then, here it is, the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. So it's like the devil here is taking everything that he has now, and he's going to give it over to the Antichrist and say, you're the man, you're the one, Okay. That's what's going to happen. He's going to give all this power and his seat, which is his throne, and his great authority, he's going to hand it over to the one. You know, the opposite of that, Jesus now knowing that God has delivered all things into his hands, the Bible says. And in Revelation chapter 5, when Jesus, we find out he's the only one worthy to take what's in God's hand, a book sealed with seven seals, He's the only one worthy to take that book. And that's, I believe, God 
giving all things into Jesus' hands. Now he has it. He now has the authority to rule over planet Earth, and he's going to come back with that book, doing it by the book. Oh, I love that. Now, what I'm going to show you here, I hate to even put it in these words. We've never seen God. No man has seen God. God was very specific when he told Israel back in uh, Deuteronomy. Uh, I think it was uh, chapter 4. Um, he told them, he said, um, be careful. Or maybe it's chapter 7, one of the two. Anyway, I think it's, it's chapter 4. Because he tells them, take heed. You saw no similitude of me upon the mountain that day. You did not see me. You did not see my face. You saw all, all you saw smoke and fire. And you ran screaming, right? Remember that day? So God says, don't make an image of me. She did. And you won't believe this. Take a look at it. Now, where it says one, creator, you see that guy there with that bald head? That's the one. You see those three underneath his chin where it says law, love, truth, mercy, life? You see those three there? Do you know who those three are? According to Betty, the one on your left is supposedly God the Father. The one on the extreme right is her God, the Holy Spirit, yeah, her. The Holy Spirit's a woman, according to Betty. And that dude in the middle is their son, Jesus. Remember what I said. Jesus is not a container for God. Jesus did not contain God. Jesus is not contained by God. Jesus is God. And Andreessen has the one as a container for God, the female Holy Spirit, and their baby boy, Jesus. That is heresy. Heresy. Then she's got all this stars, space, planets, universes, galaxies, dimensions, uh, rain, water, air, atoms, hope, mankind, darkness, Betty Lucas, 20th, 2013 September, nature, angels, color, light, word, energy, fire, life. It's all, this is all garbage, new age junk. All of this is. So listen to how she explains this drawing. This, this appears in her book called Lifting the Veil. She, she didn't lift the veil. See, it angers me. I hate every false way. She says the one most people consider to be God. The great creator whose powerful energy of word from the beginning created, and the creation was with him, and yet was him. Stop right here. There is, uh, let me tell you about um, some of the Apollo astronauts that went to the moon. Many of them had um, experiences while they were up there. Now, there's varying stories some are confirmed, some are not. Um, you know, like uh, some of them reported 
it's alleged that some of the Apollo guys that landed on the moon saw UFOs landing there, and they reported it to Houston. That's an allegation. I don't have any concrete evidence. There's a bunch of people said it did happen, and they've seen the evidence, but I've not seen the evidence, so I don't know that. Okay. But one of the things that I do know is that many of them had some serious issues when they came back from the moon. A lot of them turned right to drinking. Most of them ended up in divorce. But a couple of them had what really amounts to religious experiences. In other words, there was something. A lot of these guys were nuts and bolts, scientist-type guys going to the moon. They're worried about the mechanics of getting to the moon, making sure all the ma machines work. And then something happened on during that trip, and it altered their consciousness. Okay? And so it changed their perspective, and now they're no longer just nuts and bolts engineers and scientists. Now they have a spiritual dimension to their life. And many of them pursued that after their Apollo work. But there's this idea that a lot of UFO people are saying now that everything in the universe is connected. Everything, every atom, every molecule of every star and every planet and then every being in the universe is all connected together. Literally, everything is one. Literally. Okay? Which is like the core of Buddhism. Buddhism says everything in the universe is connected. There's a story that says when the Buddha was a little boy, that his mother saw that he had something in his mouth. And she said, open your mouth. Open your mouth. I want to see what's in your mouth. And he opened his mouth, and the whole universe was in there. Okay, that's weird. But Buddhism teaches that everything is one, and one is everything. Everything's connected. That's pantheism. Then there's panentheism, which is the next step. Because once you realize that everything is one, then you bring a divine creator into it. And that divine creator is in all of the creation. In fact, that divine creator is the creation. Now let that mess with your mind for a while. The creator is the creation. That's exactly what she just said. The great creator, whose powerful energy of word from the beginning created, and the creation was with him, and yet was him. That is like Betty Andreessen's really stinky, poor version of uh, John chapter 1. In the beginning, I just got I to gotta clear my palate here with some clean word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. But it doesn't say in here that all things was Him. She goes on, He is all there is and all that is not. Oaks, stop right here. I can't. I can't let this go. I got to clean my mouth again. You know, my mom had to wash my mouth out with soap a few times when I was a boy because I said things I shouldn't have said. And when she asked me where I heard words like that, I wasn't going to tell her the truth. I know that. So Revelation 17, get this. I'm going to read this again. She's talking about the one. The one he is all there is and all that is not. Now, what kind of stupid statement is that? He is everything that is not. It's a contradiction. Revelation 17, those same words are used to describe 
Because the angel said, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her. The mystery is the beast that thou sawest, verse 8, was and is not. <laughs> and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. It's the exact same thing that she said here. He is life and yet he is death. You know who that is? Uh, Robert Oppenheimer, the man who helped invent the atomic bomb, um, wrote after that first bomb went off. He quoted from, I think it's the Bhagavad Gita. He said, I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. That's Shiva, the God who is and is not. He's a God of opposites. He's male and female. Betty Andreessen says the one is androgynous too. Um, he has made and formed everything that exists, will exist, or ever has existed, and he continues to recreate more of him in so many different ways over and over again. We as human beings who have been given a mind and an ability to create are all part of the one's creative body. That makes us a part of one another. <laughs>